This morning I'd like to, as we begin, read uh, math, or excuse me, Mark chapter 16, verses 1 through 16. This is simply another account of the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, of Jesus meeting with his disciples, of giving them the Great Commission as a reminder that this is what our Lord calls us to do. He doesn't spell it out quite as clearly as he does in the Great Commission in Matthew 28, but it is nonetheless here. So Mark chapter 16, beginning in verse 1. Would you listen carefully to this? This is God's word. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome, brought spices so they might come and anoint him. Very early on the first day of the week, they came to the tomb when the sun had risen. They were saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? Looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled away, although it was extremely large. Entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting at the right wearing a white robe, and they were amazed. And he said to them, do not be amazed. You are looking for Jesus, the Nazarene, who has been crucified. He is risen. He is not here. Behold, here is the place where they laid him. But go tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. They went out and fled from the tomb for trembling and astonishment had gripped them. And they said nothing to anyone For they were afraid. Now after he had risen early on the first day of the week, he first appeared to Mary Magdalene, from whom he had cast out seven demons. She went and reported to those who had been with him while they were mourning and weeping. When they heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, they refused to believe it. After that, he appeared in a a different form to to two of them while they were walking along on their way to the country. They went away and reported it to the others, but they did not believe them either. Afterward, he appeared to the eleven themselves as they were reclining at the table. And he reproached them for their unbelief and hardness of heart because they had not believed those who had seen him after he had risen. And he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation." He who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved, but he who has disbelieved shall be condemned. May the Lord bless his word to our hearing this morning. Let me just mention briefly that um, people aren't condemned uh, because they don't believe the gospel. They're condemned for their sins. I mean, sometimes it almost sounds like that, but there's many people who will never hear the gospel and who actually will end up being condemned for their sins, not because they didn't hear it or because they heard it and rejected it, but because of their sins. That's why we do missionary work. They need to hear the gospel if they are to be saved. Now again, we've been looking at what the Bible has to say about missionary work, and we've seen, first of all, that missionaries aren't just those who are specially gifted and sent out to preach the gospel overseas, uh, in foreign lands and in foreign cultures, but that Jesus has called all of us to be missionaries. Uh, We might even say this is perhaps the main reason why the Lord raised us up from the dead, why we are awake among those who are still asleep, that he might send each of us to our families, to our friends, and to our neighbors, to share the simple message of the gospel that they may live. And again, let's not forget, it's not just an obligation, not just a command of the Lord, but it's a delightful one because it's a privilege to be given this responsibility. God could have given it to the angels. We saw the angels would have been thrilled to have had this responsibility, to have had this privilege to be the ambassadors of our Lord Jesus Christ. But instead he gave it to us. And it's a part of our service. It's a part of our worship. So the Lord has entrusted this to us. Now, we've seen that the Lord did not raise us and send us to do this only part-time, but to do it full-time. I think sometimes we, 
we think that this is something that we need to find time to do and somehow we just don't find the time to do it, we need to see that it's more than that. We need to see that it's really to be our main purpose in life. The reason why we are in this world is that we might, by God's grace, fulfill His great commission. And because He calls us to do this full time, we also saw that we are to see ourselves as missionaries wherever we go and with everyone that we meet. Now, if the Lord happens to believe, uh, bring a believer across to our paths, then you know, we need to fellowship with that believer. We need to encourage that believer to, uh, you know, to try to strengthen them in the work that the Lord has called them to do, which is essentially the same work that he's called us to do. And if the Lord should bring an unbeliever across our path, which he often does, we need to do whatever we can to try to introduce that person to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, don't forget that as long as anyone, any of these unbelievers that we happen to meet up with, as long as they do not believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, as long as they do not know the Lord Jesus Christ, as long as they remain outside of the Lord Jesus Christ, as long as they are not trusting in Him and repenting of their sins, as long as they are in that condition, they are in danger of going down into hell forever. There's no question that that's what the Bible teaches. There's no question that that's what God tells us is the case. The reason I emphasize that is because our flesh is going to try to convince us otherwise. We need to believe that, that they're in danger. We need to remember and believe that everyone is going to die someday. And if they die without Christ, they are going to perish. So the Lord has called us. He's called us, again, to be missionaries at, at, at all times and in all places. That is our purpose in life. What I'd like for us to consider this morning is some of the ways by which we can do missionary work and is answering the question, how should we do this? How can we reach out to others with the gospel? Now, obviously, the answer to that question is very broad, but I'm hoping that the six principles that we'll look at this morning will at least give us enough direction to get started. So let me just tell you what they are in advance. And some, I mean, they're all obvious, but again, we need to be reminded. First of all, we do need to be armed with the gospel. We have to have the message that we are to take to others. Secondly, we have to have the desire to reach the lost. We're not going to do it if we don't want to do it, we have to have a desire. Thirdly, we have to live a life that is consistent with the gospel. We don't want to undermine with our lives what we are speaking with our mouths. Fourth, we do need to go to those who need to hear Christ or who need Christ. We can't expect them to come to us. Fifthly, we need to share the gospel with them. And then sixthly, we're not done if they happen to receive the Lord Jesus Christ. The work really is just beginning. We need to get them into a local fellowship. They need to become a part of the church that so they might be discipled. So first of all, we need to be armed with the gospel. Paul writes in Romans 1.16, very familiar passage, For I am not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. Paul realized that the gospel alone was what God used to save others. The simple message of the gospel and that's why he wasn't ashamed of it. See our flesh can make us ashamed of the gospel too. For a variety of reasons and we'll look at that in just a moment. But we should never be ashamed of that message by which we are saved. That message, again, remember, is really the story of what God has done to save his people from, their, from hell, from, from their sins. How can we be ashamed of the very thing that saved us from hell? So this is the message God uses. This is the message that he brought to you so that you might be saved. This is the one that has saved you if you've trusted the Lord Jesus Christ and this is the message that you are to bring to others. Now, it's true 
that there are many things about the gospel that can be difficult to understand. I mean, when we unpack the gospel, it can get pretty complicated. And it's also true that there are a, a lot of questions that people can have about Christianity, about God, about everything that the Bible has to say. But again, let me remind you, you don't need to know all the answers to all the questions before you can begin to evangelize. All you need to know is the simple message of the gospel. All you need to do is point people to Jesus Christ. When the Philippian jailer asked Paul and Silas in Acts 16, verses 30 and 31, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They said, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. You and your household. The Philippian jailer was a Roman. He was a Gentile, as far as I know. He wasn't a God-fearer. He had no background in the gospel. And yet, Paul and Silas simply said, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. And you know what? <laughs> By God's grace, he believed. And then the apostles went and they preached the gospel to his household and they believed and they were all saved and they were all baptized. Now on the day of Pentecost when the Jews were struck to the heart by Peter's message in Acts 2 verses 37 and 38, they said to Peter and the apostles, brethren, what shall we do? Peter said to them, repent and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Many of them repented, which of course includes the idea of believing. You know, they repented of their sins, they trusted in Jesus and they were saved. Repent! That was really the, the totality of the message. Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Repent and believe. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, can you say that to others? Is, is that, is that difficult? No, it's not difficult. All you have to do is point them to Jesus Christ. And of course, all that they need to do is simply believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember the thief on the cross earlier on when he was crucified was embittered and he was angry and he was, along with the other thief, uh, was cursing Jesus Christ but not much later because they weren't on the cross for that long. He actually came to believe in him. In Luke 23, verses 42 through 43, he said, Jesus, remember me when you come in your kingdom. And he, Jesus, said to him, Truly, I say to you, today you shall be with me in paradise. All he had to do was simply trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, and he was saved. Point people to Jesus Christ. Tell them they need to trust, they need to turn from their sins. You don't have to have all the answers. You don't have to be able to answer all the complex questions in order to share the gospel. All you need to do is know the simple message and share it with others. John 3.16 For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Invite those you know to trust in Jesus Christ. That's all the Lord really expects you to do. Invite them. Tell them. This is what they need to do. Invite them to come and know the Spirit of God is going to work where and when He wills. He is the one who gives the eyes to see. He is the one who gives the ears to hear. You can't convert them. All you can do is tell them. And that's all the Lord expects you to do is simply to tell them. So be armed with the gospel. It's, again, relatively simple. That's all you need to know. Secondly, we must have the desire to reach the lost. Now here is where we run into our largest difficulty. I mean, the only thing that stops us from sharing the gospel with other people is ourselves. We stop ourselves. There's nobody else stopping us. And you know, when you really stop and think about it, it doesn't take that much time. It doesn't take that much effort, but it does take willingness, a willingness to do it. We won't share the gospel if we don't want to share the gospel. Now, we've looked at some of the reasons why we might struggle with doing this, and it may be a different reason for all of us, or there are reasons that are common to all of us. 
Well, one reason is maybe we're not convinced that it's true to the point where we're willing to open ourselves up to the ridicule that we know we may have to face if it's all for nothing. Now, you do need to realize if you don't believe these things are true, then you're not going to share them with other people. You're not going to run that risk. If you don't believe these things are true yourself, you may, you may not be converted too because remember what the Bible says. You have to believe. If you're going to trust Jesus Christ, you have to believe that He exists. If you're going to trust Him to save you from hell, you have to believe hell exists. If you don't believe those things then you really can't be a Christian. Remember what the author to the Hebrews writes in Hebrews 11.1. 1. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for. It is the conviction of things not seen. Faith is how we apprehend what the Word of God says is true. It's why we believe it's true. It's why we are moved to act the way that we act, to live the way that we live, to do the things that we do, because we believe them to be true. And remember what verse 6 also says. And without faith it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. You have to believe in order to be saved. If you don't believe these things are true so that you're unwilling to share them with others, you still need to believe and come to the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, maybe you do believe. I mean, maybe you do know him. <clears throat> but maybe when the opportunity comes to share Christ with others, you begin to doubt. I think that's more often the situation that we're faced with. But where does that doubt come from? It doesn't come from the Spirit of God. It comes from our flesh. And that doubt can overwhelm us to the point where you don't want to share the gospel with others. Well, I think you understand that if that happens to be the case, you need to grow stronger in the Lord. You need to be armed with the purpose to share Jesus Christ with others and be ready for the attack from the flesh because it's going to come against you. You realize it comes against you in everything you want to do for the Lord. Every time you want to read the Bible, something else some other desire in you is going to try to overwhelm you and keep you from reading the Bible. Every time you want to pray, it's going to overwhelm you and keep you from praying if you let it. But you can't yield to the flesh. Remember, it's not about me and what I want, but it's about Him and what I should be doing for Him, how I should be spending time with Him, how I should be learning more about Him, how I should be communing with Him that I might have the strength to do what He calls me to do for him. It's all about him. It's not all about me. It's not all about us. So grow stronger in the Lord. Maybe you're afraid of losing your friends, and that's a very real possibility. When I was, when I was a young believer and I first came to Christ, I tried to evangelize my friends. It was about the age of our, our young people here. <clears throat> and I lost all my friends because they thought I was some kind of religious fanatic because I believed the things the Bible said were true and I tried to tell them and I tried to reach out to them. Well, yes, you might lose your friends, but you really do need to ask yourself the question, just how good of a friend are you being to them if you're not willing to share with them the only truth by which they might escape an eternity of hell which is certainly in store for them if they do not repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Can you really say you love your friends if you're not willing to share the only message that can save them? Maybe you're afraid you're going to lose your popularity or that you're never going to be popular if you're open about your faith. Well, that's exactly what Jesus tells you is going to happen and the price you must be willing to pay if you're going to follow him. Jesus says in John 15, verses 18 through 19, If you were of the world, the world would love its own. The world would love you. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, because of this, the world hates you. Now, who is the world? Everyone who is not in the church today is of the world. Everyone who, you know, is not a believer is 
is the world, those people aren't going to love you, you see. You're not going to be popular with them. Those are the people who are actually going to hate you if you follow Jesus. Jesus goes on, remember the word that I said to you? A slave is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. Can you expect to be treated better than your master? But we expect that, don't we? We expect it all the time. We expect that the world's going to love us, that we can be popular and that we can do everything that the world can do. It's just that we are closet Christians at the same time, still on our way to heaven. But we can be like the world in every other regard. Well, no, the Lord says you can't. Because when he saves you, he changes you. He transforms you. He calls you to a different kind of life, a life that makes you stand out, a life that makes the world hate you because you're doing what's right and they're doing what's wrong. You're seeking to be pure and holy while they're seeking to indulge their flesh, their sensuality, their pride, and everything else that is me-centered. They are the epitome of selfishness. And the Lord calls you to be the epitome of one who loves loves others, loves Christ and loves others. Now, if that's what's holding you back, don't forget what the Lord says through James, and these are very, very sobering words, that you can't be married to Christ and to the world. If you are, well, then this applies to you, James 4.4, 4, you adulteresses. Do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. You cannot be married to two, the world and the Lord. You can't have your feet in both places. You cannot serve two masters. You have to have one or the other. Jesus says you're going to cling to one and hate the other. It can't be any other way. And James tells you that if you're going to be the friend of the world, you, you have to also understand you are an enemy of God. John writes in John, 1 John 2, verses 15 through 17, do not love the world, nor the things in the world. What are those things? Well, everything that is contrary to the will of God. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. The world is passing away, and also its lusts. But the one who does the will of God lives forever. The two are contrary. You cannot have both. So listen, as long as your heart is divided between them, and to the degree that it is divided between them, you are not going to be able to do what the Lord calls you to do as far as being his witness. If you want the Lord's help, if you want the Lord's power, your heart must be his. As a matter of fact, it must be completely his. Here's a verse we can all live by and we should take to heart. Second Chronicles 16.9 Hanani the prophet said to Asa, king of Judah, For the eyes of the Lord move to and fro throughout the earth, that he may strongly support those whose heart is completely his. God isn't going to support you if you have a divided heart. You need to overcome whatever is making you weak by God's grace, and we all have those things that grieve and quench the Spirit of God. If we are going to have the kind of courage we need and the power we need, and as we're going to see next, the kind of life that we need to live to be effective witnesses, we need to have a heart that is completely given to the Lord. How did Brainerd, how did Carey, how did Livingston, how did Mueller find the power to do what it is they did. By God's grace, they gave their hearts entirely to the Lord, and they were undivided, at least as much as humanly possible. So we need to be armed with the gospel. We need to have the desire to reach out to the lost. We need to get away, put away those things that are weakening that desire and have an undivided heart. Thirdly, we need to live a life that is consistent with the gospel, which is what we'll do if we have an undivided heart. Now, obviously, if you know the gospel, 
and you have the desire to reach out to the lost, but your life isn't consistent with that gospel, if you're not living like the Lord Jesus Christ, then you're going to undermine with your life what you are saying with your words. And I think we all know what that's about. Jesus did say we, we do need to live differently from the world. We do need to shine as lights. And in doing that, that means being like Jesus. And Jesus was not like the world. Jesus says in John 13, verses 34 and 35, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Now, I do think that Jesus here is speaking primarily about loving other believers. And sometimes we even struggle with that. Not just the people who are here, but everyone who calls upon the Lord Jesus Christ wherever they are. We do need to love them. Even if they happen to be in God's providence our personal enemies, and sadly that can happen in the church, but it should never happen because of us. As much as it depends on us, we need to live at peace with all men. But I do believe the Lord intends for us to share that love with others outside the church as well, that they will know that we are his disciples by our love. One thing that was common among all the missionaries that we're looking at is that they loved the people that they went to minister to. Paul wrote to the Corinthians that essentially our lives are like letters that are living letters, living examples of the gospel. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 2 through 3, Paul says, You are our letter, written in our hearts, known and read by all men. How do they read that letter? It's by the lives they live. It's the only way they can read it being manifested that you are a letter of Christ, cared for by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of the human hearts. Now, Paul here is simply expressing what, Jer what Jeremiah the prophet, or the Lord said through Jeremiah the prophet and the author to the Hebrews, that the essence of the new covenant is the law of God written on your hearts, and that doesn't mean, oh, now I know what God wants me to do. Or, oh, now I, I look and I see that that's good and I want to do it, but that I actually do it. And when others see me doing that, they see that I actually do have the law of God written on my heart because I am loving other Christians and I'm loving other people and I'm loving God the way that he calls me to love him. Now, when you share the gospel with someone else, they are going to be looking at you and how you live to see whether or not you really believe what it is you're telling them. If you confess Jesus with your mouth, but you live like the world, you're only going to convince them that the gospel really isn't true. But if you confess him and live like him, Jesus says you're going to be providing irrefutable evidence that the gospel is true. So in other words, you can give them an excuse not to believe while you're encouraging to believe. But instead, we need to give them no excuse. We need to give them the gospel and we need to show them that we actually believe it ourselves and are living according to it. Now fourthly, and I think quite obviously, we need to go to those who need Jesus Christ. We need to go to them. And we can't expect them to come to us. Now, it may have been like that in ancient Israel, but it's not like that today. We don't want to dismiss the idea, as I'm sure we're going to see this evening, that the Lord can bring people to himself purely through prayer. I mean, we can pray, and God can actually bring people to the worship services without even going out and trying to reach people. We've, we've seen it happen. We, we know it happens. It, they come. But we don't want to conclude from this that this is the way that the Lord Jesus Christ wants us to evangelize. I mean, Jesus does not tell us in the Great Commission, pray therefore that the Lord would bring people into the services that you might evangelize them and disciple them. Jesus says, go therefore and make disciples of all the nations. 
And that's exactly what the disciples did. They went to the people who were around where they were. They didn't just pray and expect them to come into the worship services, although, again, that may have happened. But they started where they were. They went out and reached the people in Jerusalem. They went to the marketplaces. They went wherever they were, you know, wherever they could and shared the gospel. And they worked their way out from there to the rest of the world. They went to where the people were. Paul and his companions traveled throughout the Roman Empire. David Brainerd went to where the Native Americans were. And he shared the gospel with them. Carrie went to India. Uh, Mueller to the children on the streets in, in, you know, well, in where he lived. And Livingston went to Africa. Now, we do understand that in today's world that the Lord has brought many of these people from other nations to our nation, and we can reach many different cultures, many different ethnic groups in America just by going out into our neighborhoods, <laughs> really. But we still need to go. My point is we need to go to where they are and not expect them to come here. Now, fifthly, and again, obviously, when we go, we need to share the gospel with them. It's not going to do us any good, any of the things we've looked at before, knowing the gospel, having a desire to share the gospel, living consistently with the gospel, going to the people who need to hear it, and then not sharing the gospel. Because the gospel isn't going to do them any good unless we actually communicate the gospel to them because the gospel is the power of God to salvation. But only when it is shared with other people. Now, sometimes that's, that's really all you need to do is just simply share the gospel with them because God has been working behind the scenes taking care of all the other circumstances that need to be taken care of for the gospel to hit home. That, that was what was interesting, I think, about David Brainerd because when he went to the Native Americans, the Lord, unbeknownst to him, had already prepared them to receive that gospel. They already knew that their survival, that is the, the Native Americans, depended on their integration with the white man's culture. And they actually wanted ministers to come to them and teach them so that they might become a part of the white man culture. Now, we might say, <laughs> maybe there's a better reason for wanting to hear the gospel than that, but let's not dismiss the fact that the Lord brought that about so that they would want to hear it. And many of them heard it and were saved. Now, David Brainerd also pushed deeper into the wilderness where the tribes were a little bit less, from the white man's perspective, civilized. And they didn't have that desire for the minister to come. Well, when David Brainerd sought to preach, he only found a small group of women, and he preached to them. But unknown to him, that was all he needed to do to get all these tribes of Indians to come and listen to the gospel and revival broke out because the women were apparently responsible for the spiritual well-being of, of the tribes. And when they heard and they believed, they began to gather the people and spread that word throughout all different tribes. Now, Brainerd knew nothing about that. God was working behind the scenes. All he did was he just wanted to share the gospel, and he did. And many of them were saved. God took care of the rest. But we can't always assume that that's the way it's going to work, that that's all that needs to be done. Think about this for a minute. Going to a complete stranger, sharing with them something that is, that is strange with them, something maybe they've never even heard about before, just one time, and then, and then leaving uh, that usually isn't very effective. And I'm not saying the Lord can't use that. I mean, He does use that. Sometimes people are saved. But again, God works behind the scenes. But I think most of the time there's more that we need to do. For instance, we need to get to know them. And they need to get to know us before they're going to listen to us. Now, again, case in point, William Carey. Carey went to India, he tried to communicate the gospel, but he found that he wasn't very successful in doing it, and so he had to do more to get India to get to know him. He needed to do more to build a bridge out to them. Uh, he did build this bridge. He spent time in their country. He did things to try to help them. Remember, he tried to put uh, an end to sati, uh, the burning of, of wives with their husbands. He 
He began to translate not just the scriptures into their language, but he also took their classic literature and made it available to them until he became known as the friend of India. He did more than just simply come up to a stranger with a strange message and say, you need to believe in this Jesus Christ. But he got to know them and they got to know him and he built a bridge. And then he was able to communicate and many, many people were saved. We're going to find when we get to Livingston, and I had a chance to preview that video, that uh, when he wanted to evangelize in Africa, he didn't just come up to, you know, into a tribe and, and just begin to share the gospel, but he would find out where the, the village chief lived. And he would sit outside that particular village because there were several villages and then one village where the chief lived. He sat outside the village and he lived there for some time. He spent a long time there. He got to know their language. He got to know the people. He got to know their culture. And he gave the people an opportunity to get to know him. And then he began to share the gospel with them. You know, history shows us that most of the people who have come to the Lord Jesus Christ have done so in the context of a relationship. The Billy Graham organization has estimated that of all the people who come forward at these Billy Graham crusades where you have maybe in the course of a week 80,000 people come forward, out of all those people that come forward, 2% of them actually end up in churches, 2%. And of the 2% that end up in churches, something like 98% of them were invited to the crusade by a believer who had an established relationship with them and had been ministering the gospel to them over the years. I think that's an interesting statistic, isn't it? This idea that most people come to Christ through these crusades is really not true. They come to Christ through the building of relationships and the sharing of Christ through that established relationship we have with them. You have to build a bridge if you want to cross over into somebody else's life and share the gospel with them. And then finally, we need to seek to get these that we're sharing the gospel with and these who are converted into a local fellowship. We do need to remember that Jesus did not send us to make converts merely, but to disciple the nations, to make disciples. He says again in the Great Commission, Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always even to the end of the age. We need to share the simple message of the gospel. The Spirit is the one that must convert them, but if the Spirit converts them, we need to get them into a local fellowship so that we might disciple them. I mean, those who receive Jesus are called upon by the Lord to confess Him publicly. They need to be baptized. They need to be brought into a local church they need to be instructed on how to worship the Lord and how to serve the Lord with their whole lives. And then they need to become active in serving the Lord and doing the work that the Lord has called them to do, even the same work that he calls us to do. I mean, what the Lord calls us to do can be summarized in three words, which I think can be helpful words. Win, you know, evangelize others. Disciple. Baptize and teach them. And then send them. Get them involved in the work. Win, disciple, and send. That is really what the Great Commission is all about. By the way, I'm not depreciating the fact that the Lord wants us to gather together for worship. But we do need to understand that this is the way that he primarily equips us to do the work that he has called us to do in the world, which is to be full-time missionaries. And so this morning, be encouraged to know the gospel. Strengthen your desire to reach out to others with the gospel. Cut off those things that weaken you. Live a life that is consistent with the gospel. Don't have a divided heart between the world and the Lord. Be entirely the Lord's and live in the way that he calls you to live. Go to those who need to hear the gospel. Don't expect them to come to you. Share the gospel with them. 
And if they come to the Lord Jesus Christ, seek to get them into a local fellowship where they can be equipped to do this work along with you. This is what your Savior calls you to do. This is what basically um, you should do because of the love that he has shown you. Freely you have received, freely give. Do this because you love others. Do this because you love him. Do this because this is what your Lord would have you to do. Well, let, let's bow in a, in a few moments of prayer and let's ask the Lord to help us do that.